Well, thanks for being part of this exciting meeting, and um, I hope that I can provide some exciting data to you as well. Um, we, we shift a little bit gears, we leave CAR T cells and we just change basically the cell type and we go to CAR T Rex. And um, again, we try to use this for local and tissue specific tolerance induction in organ transplantation and in autoimmunity. And um, basically I have to say, whenever Andreas Mackensen is making a meeting and the, the meetings on cell therapy in Erlangen were outstanding. And last time I've been there in Erlangen, um, there was a partial lunar eclipse. And obviously the CAR T cell meetings, which Andreas is organizing, are under a good star, because this is a picture from Toronto yesterday afternoon where we had a total lunar eclipse. And you see it's hop hop hopefully a good sign for CAR T cell therapies that Andreas Mackensen can even move the stars to make this all happen. Well, starting with my talk, I, the disclosure is that for this talk that I'm co-founder of Quell Therapeutics, and you will see that some of the translations we are doing are basically done with Quell Therapeutics to start off. I mean, we know that we basically have various type one and type two immune cells in there. And why the topic of yesterday was basically to get rid of some cells and then get a new naive cell, um, B cell compartment coming up. Um, or get rid of the T cells which are causing autoimmunity, um, like in the pamphigus setting, we are rather aiming in using the regulatory T cells to control these various other cell types. Um, and um, the nice thing is that um, basically T-Rex can do this and it has been shown uh, for a long time that they can um, basically regulate a whole bunch of other pro-inflammatory cell types and thereby re-establishing immune homeostasis. And so basically, um, if we start, what can we do in transplantation? This is one of the strongest immune responses we have. It's about 10 to 15 percent of all T cells um, have allospecificity. And so if we look in transplant, and I'm the medical director of the liver transplant program in Toronto, uh, which is the largest in North America, and we, we sometimes can get very highly pre-selected patients and then we can stop them in weaning trials. And these were trials done in Europe um, in collaboration with Alberto Sanchez Fueyo from King's College. And you can see that we can achieve operational tolerance in some patients, um, but we have to wait relatively long. And one also has to say these are highly pre-selected patients. So it's about 10 to 15% of all liver transplant patients. And even there, as recent trials in Europe and US showed, it's not really 80%. We are achieving 15 to 20% in highly pre-selected patients. And we don't want to wait 10 years. Uh, so the aim is really, if we go into transplant, that we give those um, regulatory T cells early on, and then perhaps we have a higher success of operational tolerance, meaning um, that the graft is accepted in the absence of any immunosuppression. Well, if we look into these clinical trials, which were done with uh, operational tolerant patients, and we look what's happening, and then we see, although these patients were here one year completely off immunosuppression, that they have some portal infiltrates. Um, it's not an acute rejection, but in, if we look further in detail, we see that these um, infiltrates are dominated by regulatory T cells. So tolerance induction in the human system is not like what we see sometimes in mice within days or weeks. It takes years. Because then if you do rebiopsies um, of these livers three years later, you see that then the portal T-Rex are coming down. And if we look on a molecular level, we see that at year one, it's a pretty active process. So you see that pro-inflammatory and um, anti-inflammatory genes are going up. We see these immune infiltrates and it takes up to three years before all these signatures are coming down. So th this is a hint that regulatory T cells might play a role in tolerance induction. Well, this is clinically all feasible, and this is a proof of concept study um, published in 2016 from a group in Japan where they did a liver transplantation in a living donor um, situation, and then they were uh, basically giving adoptive transfer of Treg enriched cells. This was not really regulatory T cells, but they were enriched by in vitro cultures to this. But quite remarkably, after um, six months, they started weaning, where usually everyone would reject. And basically, here seven out of the ten patients were tolerant, 
And even in the three years follow up, those seven patients were still tolerant. And from these um, three patients, which rejected, two of them had autoimmune liver disease as the baseline. So this is a study, although it's relatively old, which has not been reproduced so far. There's a trial running right now, the Okaido trial in Japan, trying to reproduce this. And there's a trial um, in Sweden running with a, with a similar um, basically concept. Uh, but at least it's a proof of concept showing that adoptive um, T-Rex therapy could induce tolerance even in very strong immune responses. Well, we set out to use um, chimeric antigen receptors, which of course are all familiar to you. And we started off with a chimeric antigen receptor coming from an A2 um, allosensitized patient. And this is basically a classical second generation car. We know by now that basically the 28 Zeta is at least from all what we have right now, the best um, um, adapter molecule here for regulatory T cells. So 41BB is not really helpful in this setting. So it's usually a 28 Zeta. And this is specific for an A2 um, um, MHC class one molecule. So basically the idea being that we have an MHC um, A2 negative recipient receiving an A2 positive liver, and then we are trying to induce tolerance in there. Well, if we look at what this car is doing, and you will see this uh, during my talk, so we have a very uh, good um, reporter hybridoma. So whenever the car or the TCR is giving a signal, um, there's an NFAT dependent promoter turning on GFP, and this is how we look for tonic or um, auto-inflammation versus um, car activation. And what you can basically see, if we take our A2 car, with A2 positive stimulator cells that we have a strong activation of these hybridoma cell line. While if we have A2 negative cells, there's almost no activation, so meaning no auto activation. This is very important. Um, Ulrike has basically pointed this out. And we have to say with hundreds and hundreds of cars we made in the past 10 years, we have to say that 20 to 25% have quite a level of auto activation. So this is something which you really have to test in there. I should also say that all the binders you will see in my talk are all human um, single chain FV binders. So we always look for direct translation in there. So coming back to our A2 car, if we now compare in a mixed lymphocyte reaction, the ability of the A2 car T-Rex to suppress these, you see that they are way more potent than the natural T-Rex in suppression. And even at the dilution where we have one um, car T-Rex, and 128 effector cells, we still see significant inhibition in here. So me, uh, showing that these um, CAR t rays are quite active in suppressing effector T cells. Well, then we looked into humanized mouse models and these are NLG mice, which were reconstituted with human PBMCs. Um, and the PBMCs were A2 um, negative. And then we transplanted human A2 positive skin and you see, if you give no T-Rex, um, you see rejection of those skin grafts. If you give polyspecific T-Rex, there is some delay of rejection. But if we give our A2 car T-Rex, there is no rejection at all um, in the absence of any immunosuppression, meaning that we have operational tolerance um, for these animals in there. Well, if we then look at the skin grafts, we see a strong local accumulation um, of these. Uh, they also have an LNGFR truncated marker in there. And you see here that these cells are in the graft and this is where we find them. And they have a long-term persistence within the graft as well. And um, in mouse experiments before we could show that you could even transfer tolerance with the graft um, to new animals in there. Well, this has led to um, the foundation of Quell Therapeutics in 2019, and I'm one of the co-founders, and we have right now about 150 employees in London, and um, this is what we use, the same car which I just showed you in the liberal trial. What is the liberal trial? So it's our car, which I just introduced to you, which is A2 positive. We also, and this is data I'm not showing today, but we published this last year. If you put an extra Fox P3 in, you prevent basically that these T-Rex lose their phenotype or stability in there because now they are specific for the graph.
graft. So stability of the phenotype is very important. And then as, as this is a non-malignant situation, we have a safety switch, which is a surface molecule, which we could use to deplete those cells in case of with rituximab. And we take basically patients who are um, after liver transplantation and they are one year out. So we don't come directly at the time of transplant, but we wait a year. Um, and then we, they are basically switched to a combination immunotherapy of tacrolimus and an mTOR inhibitor, everolimus. Uh, we start the manufacturing. Um, if those patients have a biopsy, which is consistent with criteria uh, for tolerance induction. This is basically coming from all those trials in the past 10 years, and there is an agreement of what patient can be used to lower immunosuppression in there. Um, we have a mild um, conditioning with basically thymoglobulin in there. It's not cyclophosphamide, so it's thymoglobulin. And then basically uh, why we wait that these antibodies are disappear, uh, we stop the tacrolimus in this phase, and then we infuse those CAR T-Rex, um, and then we start later on the weaning of the mTOR inhibitor. Um, the first three patients um, have been um, already treated. This is just a safety cohort. Um, we don't have the clinical data from these, but these were not to, meant to be weaned. I can just tell you it's completely safe, no cytokine release syndrome no infection so far, we can detect those CAR T-Rex, but the analysis of this patient and the last patient just got treated two weeks ago is ongoing before we go into the second step when then the weaning will also be done. The nice thing in this trial is that we have access to the um, target here. So there, there are frequent biopsies as you see that we can really see what's happening with those CAR T-Rex in the tissue, what's their phenotype and with single cell sequencing, um, what's their effect of function in there. So where do we go from here? Um, well, the problem still in transplantation is that there's a lot of I, not a lot of IL-2 around because those patients are treated with CNI inhibitors. We, so we want to make those um, T-Rex independent of IL-2. And um, as you know, there are even um, low-dose trials with low-dose IL-2. Well, um, it didn't work too well in diabetes and in transplantation. So this is why we basically say, well, let's give our T-Rex, which we are giving um, intrinsic advantage. And so what we basically did in, um, in addition to the CAR expression, we have a membrane bound IL-2 and the linker here is quite important because we don't want to have transactivation, which you basically see in all those trials with low dose IL-2. And this is why they failed in diabetes um, and in transplant and in many other diseases. So just IL-2 in chronic stimulated immune responses doesn't seem to be the trick. So we basically just want to have um, a um, cis activating approach and a survival advantage for our CAR T-Rex. Well, this is how the construct looked like. So we basically have the car and then we have the membrane IL-2 and we have a transduction marker, which is a truncated LNGFR. And you see that both are um, expressed on the surface of our regulatory T cells if we transduce them with this retrovirus. And if we first look into an IL-2 dependent cell line, uh, what you can nicely see while uh, under conditions where you usually don't have IL-2 and these cell line is dying within a very short time. Here we now see expansion of these cells and you see the survival advantage of these cells. Also, if we start with a transduction efficiency of 20%, you see that under no IL-2 conditions, and now the, it's just the cells with the membrane IL-2, which are uh, basically surviving and therefore uh, within three days, they are almost doubling with their amount in there. Uh, we looked how much of these IL-2 is shedded into the supernatant. And if we measure this, you see there is a little bit of shedding in there, but it's a very tiny amount. It would correspond in the tissue culture to about two picogram per ml, so relatively low and much lower than what we see here on a logarithmic scale uh, with the units we usually need for having a meaningful effect clinically of the IL-2. Well, we looked, uh, what is it doing with the T-Rex? So we are looking here at uh, phosphostat 3 and you, what you can basically see under no IL-2 conditions that we have um, a strong phosphostat C phosphorylation in here. But you can also see that although there are untransduced cells in the same well, 
that the untransduced neighboring cells are basically not upregulating FOXP3. So you basically have to express these marker to be um, positive in there. We also did co-culture experiments. And what you see, this is the phosphostat 3 under high units um, of IL-2. And if we then have a control car T-Rex, they have no phosphostat 3. And while our um, car T-Rex with the membrane IL-2 are highly activated in phosphostat 3, there's no extra activation of neighboring cells in the same um, U-bottom well, meaning that there's really almost no trans activation to other cells around which is relatively important in there. Well, another good effect of this extra um, IL-2 is the stability of the T-Rex phenotype. Um, T-Rex might lose and downregulate some of their FOXP3. I have to say these T-Rex are still all FOXP3 positive. So this would be the negative gate. But what you can see that under low IL-2 concentrations, they downregulate their FOXP3 level. And if we have the membrane IL-2 in addition to the CAR T-Rex, what you see that uh, basically just um, the transduced cells are now staying um, at least 50% of them FOXP3 high, meaning that this extra IL-2 is not just a survival advantage, but it also stabilizes the phenotype of these regulatory T-cells in there. Well, we then tested different um, pro-inflammatory cytokine mixes um, and what you can basically see that uh, if you have an extra membrane bound IL-2, uh, that under those pro-inflammatory conditions, the MFI of FOXP3 is much higher in those cells. So again, even under pro-inflammatory condition, there's quite a difference to those cells which are just having the control um, car in there without the extra membrane IL-2. Um, we also looked to the phenotype of the cells. I told you that they have more FOXP3, and this is also correspondent. If we look in the supernatant after activation, they produce more IL-10 um, than just the normal T cells, so meaning stability um, is higher um, and also most likely effector function. Well, if we uh, test effector function again in a mixed uh, lymphocyte reaction, uh, what you can basically see is um, that compared to control car, they are a little bit um, higher effective. It's not, it's not highly significant in there, but at least in these um, um, MLR assays in, in vivo, it looks like there might be a difference in there. Well, again, we looked into humanized mice, and these are competitive repopulation experiments. So basically, we gave the CAR T-Rex and the CAR T-Rex with membrane IL-2 at a one-to-one -one ratio into humanized PBMC reconstituted mice, and then we stimulated them just a single time with allogeneic PBMCs. And what you can basically see is that the uh, normal CAR T-Rex after a single stimulation are not visible at all. We started with a one-to-one -one ratio of these cells. The only cells really surviving under these conditions in vivo are those cells uh, which received an extra membrane IL-2. And uh, what is quite interesting, of course, that there is no um, trans activation in there. So if we, if we looked into these cells, um, uh, there are no other cells surviving in there. So again, showing that it's mainly a cis effect of what we are seeing in here. Well, we we also look what does this mean in the in the context of transplantation, where we perhaps cannot immediately wean everyone of um, CNI inhibitors. And what you can see, of course, we know that CNIs is reducing IL-2 from effector T cells, but CNIs also have an effect on regulatory T cells and are inhibiting the proliferation of these T-Rex in there. And what we can see in an in vitro assay, if we have the membrane IL-2, is a much stronger proliferation in the absence of CNI inhibitors. And we used a tacrolimus level of five nanograms per ml, which is basically a common trough level seen uh, post uh, one year in liver transplant recipients. So we think that in addition to the higher stability, we also make them resistant um, to tacrolimus. And again, this is something we tested in the humanized mice. So again, we took NRG mice, we constituted them with PBMCs, gave our two car T-Rex again at a one-to-one -one ratio. But now these cells were also um, getting a daily dose of tacrolimus. Um, basically leading to trough levels of about 5 to 10 nanogram per ml. And we stimulated them with PBMCs. 
And you see there's just very little survival of those car T-Rex, which we've given under the uh, conditions with Tacrolimus. Um, but the only cells really surviving are our uh, T-Rex, which have an extra membrane IL-2. So we believe that this is uh, something which could be combined in future clinical trials um, to make these cells less dependent of IL-2. Well, this is transplantation. You might have followed recently that, you know, because of the um, scarcity of organs, we go into um, xenotransplantation. And Germany has a very successful consortium on xenotransplantation that we are part of, which was led by Bruno Reichert and now by Eckhard Wolf. And um, the protocol, basically, which has been used in those two patients, has been developed in Munich. Um, just it takes sometimes a little bit longer to get allowance to do this in Germany than in the US, but it's the exact protocol of the Munich group published in Nature um, three years ago now. And these are the two patients receiving heart transplants. Unfortunately, uh, both of them died um, of um, most likely re uh, rejections, but you might have followed just um, two weeks ago, there was a first pick to human um, kidney transplant at Mass General. The patient is now discharged from Mass General, and it seems um, without uh, or with good function of the kidney, though he had a very severe rejection 10 days um, after transplantation, but he is now at home and we are following up what's happening in there. So the idea is, of course, with these very strong stenospecific immune responses, can we do something in there? And indeed, we basically um, came from phage display libraries, and you really have to screen a lot of clones in there uh, to find one which is not recognizing human um, MHC class one, but just the class one from porcine, and which is then recognizing all class one molecules from uh, the different porcine strains. And this is basically our xenospecific car. And these are curves you've seen before. And this is now a car recognizing xenoantigen. And you see way more potent at all dilutions in this xenospecific mixed lymphocyte reaction than in a relevant car or NTREX in there. And this is a very sensitive assay where we basically tried to prevent killing um, of allogeneic targets. We gave those targets uh, with syngeneic in a one-to-one -one ratio. If you give no T-Rex, you see that all um, xenospecific targets are deleted, and it's just the um, syngeneic targets. Um, if you give polyspecific T-Rex, you have some rescue of your xeno targets, but if we give the SLA car T-Rex, you see complete prevention of killing of xenospecific targets in those humanized mice which is the most sensitive assay in there. And we saw the same thing if we transplant now islets uh, from pigs into humanized mice, um, untreated, they are all developing diabetes, as you see, while if they get the CAR T-Rex, now xenospecific CAR T-Rex, we can completely prevent the rejection of those islets. And the same is true with porcine skin, which is the strongest immune response. Um, Again, if you just give polyspecific T-Rex into humanized mice, the porcine skin is being rejected with some delay. But if we now give our xenospecific CAR T-Rex, we see complete prevention of rejection. And we hope this is now in um, non-human primates in collaboration with a group in Munich. And we hope that with this, even xenotransplantation um, could become feasible um, in the situation. Now, coming um, in the last part to what are we doing in type 1 diabetes. And in type 1 diabetes, of course, we have very few regulatory T cells. Um, this is a, a nice work showing that it's about one in a million cells in blood is recognizing insulin and its peptides. So relatively low cell numbers. And then the question is, can we give T-Rex in recent onset type 1 diabetes? And this is for me a milestone trial from Jeff Bluestone, um, which was not effective in, in curing type 1 diabetes. But you see the expansion here and the persistence, and he was labeling those cells. And the very important part in here is safety, because now we are not in oncology or not severe autoimmunity. These patients are otherwise on insulin therapy. But here, even very high doses of T-Rex were safely given no cytokine release syndromes. They have a very stable phenotype. They don't switch back, yet they were not effective in this clinical trial. But if you think what I told you before, that about one in a million cells is specific for a given beta cell antigen, 
what Jeff did here was transferring five to 2,000 specific T-Rex, and this is perhaps not the right number. And this is why we basically set out to see, can we change the specificity of those T-Rex? And we started by using T uh, TCRs. So this is basically T-Rex with a TCR recognizing beta cells. And again, they can inhibit in vitro immune responses of beta cell specific cells. But if we come to the most uh, durable model, which is recent onset type one diabetes, what we can see, these mice are all diabetic, a single dose of these TCR beta cell specific T-Rex is stabilizing the disease. And then they become normal glycemic in there and all other specificities cannot achieve the same thing. So we believe that this is really a, a nice approach uh, to go into these kind of autoimmune diseases. The problem, of course, is this is a TCR, so it's MHC class two restricted. So we, we uh, let me go over this. So we changed the strategy and we're basically also trying to go uh, with chimeric antigen receptors while we set out with a huge project to make cars against the uh, six different um, target um, antigens. In the end, uh, it was over 120 cars, which we tested. Um, and I'm just showing the result on one of those cars. I have to say uh, the, the method we are using is a human phage display library. And basically we are taking cells um, expressing our target on the surface. And then we do several penning rounds. We try to be um, species cross-reactive with our binders, basically that we can do the proof of concept experiments in mouse models, but can use the same cars then as a human car vector into clinical translation. And you see, this is quite laborious work. Um, we have to do up to five rounds of panning strategies, and we sometimes switch between cells which have the human or the murine protein to come up with species cross-reactive binders. But just to show you how these binders look like, so our target cells are always GFP positive and the binders would shift those up. And this is basically a, a negative control. And you always want to have to shift up just of the GFP positive cells and not of the others. So we basically found uh, several binders in here from the 126 cars we made. I think we had over 1,200 different binders against these um, six um, target proteins. Well, if we look at those binders, you see they can nicely stain beta cells within uh, the, the pancreas. So meaning that they can recognize the target in there. And whenever we do um, CAR T-Rex, we have two different formats um, in there. It's a classical second generation CAR, but we have different transmembrane and different hinge regions in there. We always have a Thy1 um, transporter gene and we always have an additional FOXP3 to lock the T-Rex phenotype. Well, this is a lot of uh, fax plots here, but you've seen this. This is again the hybridoma cells where we are looking at our cars and they are upregulating GFP um, and, um, if they are activated in there. And what you can nicely see that we have strong activation of those hybridomas with our car and very little to no um, auto activation in these settings, especially for those ones which we are taking here. You see almost all um, uh, cars um, activating here and there's no um, auto activation if these cells didn't express the target. And then we went into um, basically a synchronized model of type one diabetes, which is giving not mice a low dose of cyclophosphamide and then within three weeks, they are all developing type one diabetes. And we first looked for homing of CAR T effector cells. And what you can nicely see, if we have these um, beta cell specific CAR in there, um, they home CD4 and CD8 cells specifically to the pancreatic islands, which is not seen with the control CAR in here. So we have specific homing. And if we now look, if we can prevent diabetes, you can basically see that by giving those CAR T-Rex, we can completely prevent the development of type one diabetes while a control car has no effect. And uh, you see not all of our cars were successful. This is against a different binder. So um, uh, you need to have the right car to basically get activation of these protective phenotype. If we look, where do we find our CAR T-Rex? We just find them in the pancreatic islets. We don't find them, of course, in the pancreatic lymph nodes because these are CARs and not um, TCRs. 
And uh, then if we look in recent onset, and this is really data just coming out of the lab of six animals, basically with recent onset uh, type one diabetes, you can see that we can um, cure and stabilize those mice. These two mice, which were not cured, basically by the time they received the cells, their blood sugar was always uh, over 500, meaning that most likely the targets which were which were protected and which the car is recognizing were already gone. And this is why we couldn't rescue them, but all the other mice we could rescue in these recent onset testing. And you might have read, I mean, this data was quite convincing. And basically now um, Quell is teaming up with Astra and Astra is supporting this clinical development in order to the immunity was up to 2 billion. Of course, this is just um, if it really goes into all the phase three trials, but at least it gives us the potential to develop this now also in autoimmunity. And we believe we could use this at various stages of type one diabetes. Um, most, um, uh, the most uh, first clinical trial will be done in stage three, which is the recent onset situation. And we believe these are the situations where we can use immune regulatory cells. Well, if you have long standing disease, we are not sure if you have enough beta cells left. So we might combine um, our tolerance inducing strategy there with beta cell replacement. And just to show you, we've now transplanted four patients at Toronto General with um, stem cell derived beta cells. And these are our uh, first two patients which we had. And basically, they, uh, all our four patients are now off insulin. And this is basically the mixed meal tolerance test 12 months after receiving stem cell derived beta cells. And what you can see uh, that while in baseline, there's no control that after 12 months in both patients, there's normal glycemia in the mixed meal tolerance and quite a strong C peptide secretion in both patients. And the next step would be that we're trying to combine those two therapies. So let me summarize. I hope I could convince you that the A2 CAR TUX could prevent the other rejections in the absence of any immunosuppression and the mechanisms as local accumulation and long-term persistence. And the clinical trial, the liberal trial, is currently still running. Um, the xenotransplantation part is currently in non-human primates, but with the first xenotransplant trials now being started, I think this is also on the edge of translation. I think in the transplant setting, it will be helpful to stabilize the phenotype of those T cells and to give them survival conditions with these extra um, um, IL-2 signal. And I've shown you uh, very recent data that we now, I think, have a good car um, to use in type 1 diabetes. Again, we see local accumulation. Um, we see no autoactivation, and it's completely preventing type 1. But I've also shown you the recent data that it can basically cure already established type 1 diabetes in there. And with this, I want to thank um, the group, um, especially Fatih Noyan and Tom Pieper, who were involved in these trials. Katarina Zimmermann was basically doing the yellow car um, together with Michael Tenspolde, who is now working with BioNTech. And um, with this, I thank you for your attention and for any PhD student in there, if you think Canada is a beautiful um, country where you can do nice science, please contact me. Um, we, are, we have just entered into a new lab era here. Um, and um, as you see, quite fancy and nice. And we are starting this right now. And we are trying to make translational differences in there. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm again, sorry that I couldn't be there in person. For sure, the next meeting Andreas is organizing, I will be there hopefully then as a permanent resident.